Good evening. My name is Renee Sanchez, and I'm the founder and chair of the Nursing Administration Alumni Advisory Council. I'm also a member of the Myers Alumni Board. I would like to welcome you to our event tonight featuring Dr. Patricia Benner. Dr. Patricia Benner is the Dean Scholar at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Nursing, and a professor emerita at the University of California School of Nursing. She is a noted nursing educator and author of From Novice to Expert, Excellence and Power in Nursing Practice. She directed the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching National Nursing Education Study, Educating Nurses, A Call for Radical Transformation. She is the founder and executive director of EducatingNurses.com and a co-founder of NoviceToExpert.org, an online simulation that teaches clinical reasoning using authentic clinical cases. Dr. Benner is a true living legend of the Academy, American Academy of Nursing. We've asked Dr. Benner to share her wisdom gleaned from her body of research about making practice visible to help us think about how to address challenges facing nursing profession today. We are honored to have Dr. Benner here this evening. The aim of the Nursing Administration Alumni Advisory Council is to keep alumni connected to the college and to each other for the purposes of sharing, refining, and extending our individual leadership and practice. Everyone on the council is a proud graduate of the Nursing Administration Master's Program at NYU. This program prepared us for advanced leadership roles in contemporary complex healthcare organizations and taught us how to meet the dual accountabilities of nurse executive practice to provide leadership for the practice of nursing and other pa patient care disciplines and to provide innovative and transformation transformative leadership within the organization. As alumni, we recognize the leadership development that continues for us throughout our Nursing Administration Council. I would like to first welcome Professor Eloise Cathcart for opening remarks. Professor Cathcart is the Director of Nursing Administration Program at NYU. Dr. Patricia Benner's work has been embedded throughout the, our education and nursing administration program. It is humbling to be hosting an event centered around Dr. Patricia Benner's work. It is now my pleasure to welcome Professor Eloise Cathcart. I want to join you, Renee, in welcoming everyone who is here with us tonight, especially Dr. Benner, during this month that's dedicated to recognizing nurses. Um, I met Patricia Benner over 30 years ago. I was a director of nursing at Boston Children's Hospital leading a committee charged with developing a clinical advancement and recognition program for nurses who wish to remain engaged in practice as a career endeavor. The literature of the day told us that when nurses become really good at taking care of patients and families, they should be rewarded with positions of education or in education and administration deemed more prestigious and associated with better quality of life. But the magnificent nurses at Boston Children's didn't want that, they wanted to practice. When we found Patricia's early work and then her seminal research described in her book From Novice to Expert, we knew it would be our guide. We knew that Patricia had captured what it means to be a nurse, not in theoretical concepts or platitudes, but from mining the practice itself. We weren't researchers and we didn't know how to do interpretive phenomenology, but we followed Patricia's methodology the best we could. We heard compelling narratives of expert nurses at Children's, which formed the basis for our program, which still exists to this day. We invited Patricia to look at our work and that began for me, a wonderful mentorship and journey of, leader, of learning. Patricia's work has informed my own practice as a chief nursing officer, as an organizational executive, and Renee is correct. Patricia's work is embedded into the curriculum of the nursing administration program at Myers. I learned a long time ago that the edge of excellent chief nursing officers is their ability to see the world through the eyes of the clinical nurse. Patricia's work does not offer a quick fix for the challenges we face as nurse leaders. It is not about using protocols, following rules or checklists, or completing projects. Rather, her work offers an invitation to get our hands into the rough ground of the practice 
and to call out the healing relationship of the nurse and the patient, to understand the incredible skill, knowledge, judgment, and caring practices of expert nurses, and to see clearly why this practice is worthy of recognition and reward. So we are delighted to have Patricia Benner with us. There will be an opportunity for conversation with Dr. Benner. We welcome your questions and ask that you put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box. Those are my instructions to you. And now, Dr. Benner. Thank, thank you, Eloise. Um, I have so many great memories of the Boston children's work because those pediatric nurses understood development, right? And also they were at the cutting edge of pediatric practice and they were often describing syndromes for the very first time. And the knowledge work of those nurses was amazing. And, um, and their program is still robust today. So we're going to have a conference later on in this year just celebrating the success of that. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm really hoping that we will make this conversation um, uh, because I, I will say some things that you may not understand or, or, or you question, and I'd love to have the dialogue with, with you. So, um, oops. So, um, making practice visible. Uh, I hope by the end of this talk, you will see what, what prevents us from making uh, nursing practice visible besides the, the disgusting uh, status inequities, uh, uh, the women's profession of a woman's profession of caregiving, which um, by the way, you can get easily burned out caregiving, but skydiving, not so much. Um, the, just the um, devaluation of care of the body of women's work is, is already a big hurdle. Um, but we want to think about nursing as a practice. And Joseph Dunn in his uh, terrific book for teachers on Back to the Rough Ground points out that a practice isn't just a surface on which one can display instant virtuosity. It grounds one in a tradition that has been formed through an elaborate development and that exists at any juncture only in the dispositions, skilled know-how, slowly and perhaps painfully acquired of its recognized practitioners. Um, and Alastair McIntyre's um, is probably written the definitive work on uh, in his book After Virtue on noting that um, a practice is self-improving, otherwise it's a museum. Um, it's socially embedded knowledge and uh, that contains situated know-how with notions, um, notions of good, I've left off good there, uh, internal to that practice. It's a practice is self-sustaining, whereas theory is dependent on practice and unsustainable without a practice. I say that for all you Cartesians out there, all of, the, all of us have been so raised up in, in Descartes' notion that formal concepts, ideas, representations in the mind are the source of all knowledge, which is now absolutely proven to be false uh, with the current uh, studies, uh, neurocognitive studies of learning. Um, so theory is parasitical on practice. Practice is the rich, deep repository that makes theorizing possible. Um, and theory is always um, a sort of collection, generalization, a concentration of knowledge from practice, but it has to go back to practice itself for the source. So practice is a source of knowing and a way of knowing in its own terms. 
And in bureaucracies and in hospitals in particular, we act as if we need to stamp out knowledge on the practice without realizing what a deep and rich resource practice itself is. Because practice requires embodied intelligent agents committed to living out the notions of good and qualitative distinctions that are central and internal to that practice. Um, Sullivan and Rosen in their book, um, An, A New Agenda for Higher Ed, talk about practical reasoning. And that's one of the focuses of our, our talk today. Um, practical reasoning, which is at the very center of frontline clinical nursing, it's clinical reasoning. Um, it was once central to education, but it's been eclipsed in the focus on utility on one side and on abstract analytic thinking on the other. And nursing, it's been the nursing process, which is a ersatz uh, scientific reasoning process that no cl clinician ever really uh, can engage in because uh, nurses engage in science using practical clinical reasoning. We'll come back to that, but this confusion over um, uh, scientific snapshot reasoning uh, as the way, as, as the source of nurses practice and knowledge is very confusing. Practical reasoning, in contrast, is concerned with the formation of a particular kind of person, one who is disposed toward questioning and criticizing for the sake of a more informed, responsible practice engagement. Such persons use critique in order to act more responsibly uh, and in order to uh, realize the valuable purposes and ideals that guides the reasoning. Now, we did a study of nurses who had been in practice for over 20 years, but weren't considered experts. And what we found is that they had, um, they had a problem with qualitative distinctions and notions of good. They bought the story that nurses just engaged in scientific reasoning process, this disengaged, standing over against snapshot reasoning that models scientific um, problem solving, which is terrific for scientific experiments, but you, you can't make that happen in uh, clinical practice. So Jane Rubin did a, a wonderful chapter for us in expertise nursing practice. And she points out that these nurses who had little or no narrative memory of their actual practice, when they told, when they, they, they tended to give us litanies of tasks and events, we did not get acquainted with their patients when they told about their practice. Um, and Jane says about these, Dr. Wooten says about these nurses is that they were somewhat aware of their problem. Um, their awareness uh, manifested itself in their wish to make a difference and to have a genuine sense of making a difference, a genuine sense of agency. Um, and Jane points out the solution to the problem would seem to be neither psychotherapy nor ethics courses for these nurses, important as these are in other contexts. But a form of nursing education, and I would add, and of nursing practice, that is governed by the goal of improving clinical and ethical judgment by focusing on the good specific to nursing practice and the skills that allow nurses to achieve them. And that's the heart of this presentation. Um, practice as it's actually done on the cutting edge by expert nurses is all but invisible to us by, by virtue of the way we describe our practice. Um, so expert nursing practice uh, includes this rapid clinical 
reasoning, practical, a form of practical reasoning, reasoning across time about the particular through changes in the patient and or changes in the clinician's understanding of the patient, uh, the patient's situation. So it's situated thinking action, situational awareness, skill know-how, and rapid clinical decision making. But descriptions of this and awareness of this is all but missing in nursing. Um, we're hindered by formal written accounts of knowing that and knowing about with almost no descriptions of knowing how and when or descriptions of situational awareness and rapid clinical reasoning. Formal accounts of knowing that and about, I want to really convince you today, prevents the description and our awareness of and our development of expert nursing practice. Um, we imagine that techne or technique um, uh, in uh, Joseph, Joseph Dunn's book, again, Back to the Rough Ground, is, is confused with uh, uh, expertise or phronesis, wisdom in the Greek uh, tradition. Techne is about producing or making things. It can be standardized, outcomes are predictable, separating means and ends are not a problem. Um, but clinical judgment um, as phronesis or wisdom and skilled know-how is not at all the same as techne. It is that reasoning across time. Uh, with notions of good in mind. And I'm going to give you examples of um, this situated thinking in action account versus the formal knowing that and about counts and have you judge the distance between those two descriptions. It, uh, because situated practical reasoning, frontline expert nursing practice, is engaged, embodied, intelligent agency required, and it focuses on acting responsibly for the good of the patient outcomes. So phronesis or clinical judgment and wisdom are best suited for underdetermined situations. Now, most clinical situations, and if you're an e emergency department nurse, this is writ large, but really most clinical situations are underdetermined. Often there are comorbidities, there are multiple treatment interactions and patient responses. Um, so uh, clinical reasoning requires ongoing experiential learning. And by experiential learning, I mean having your understanding of the situation turned around, uh, changed, by the experience. Otherwise, it's just passage of time. And please don't call it experiential learning. Our, our nurses who didn't become experts had 20 years in practice, but very little experiential learning. Um, for practice and for expertise, skill, character development are required. Mutual influence between patient, family, nurse, and team are often involved. Pre-specified outcomes cannot be reliably predicted. Uh, you're probably all too young to remember when we wanted um, predictable outcomes every eight hour shift for our patients, which of course was faulty and impossible um, because the situations are too complex. So, I want to give you an example of what we take as typical accounts for knowing that and about. This comes from a burn textbook. Um, you get explain you you want the nurse to be able to explain the pathophysiology of acute burn injury, thermal injury, chemical injury, and electrical injury with assistance because they're beginners. Here we go in this textbook. Uh, describe normal skin anatomy, 
describe Jackson's zones of inquiry, differentiate pathophysiology related to etiology of injury. You get the point, you've read a textbook before. Um, and all of this is necessary, but not sufficient for expert nursing performance. This is only knowing that and about. Do not be so awed by it. It's not what's required in frontline expert performance. So now let me give you a comparison description. This comes from uh, a researcher observing an expert nurse, and it particularly it's, it's an expert burn nurse. So I want you to remember our burn nurse um, knowledge, knowing that and about um, uh, uh, describes the impact of the injury etiology on the extent and depth of injury, all of that, knowing that and about. Compare that with this nurse is being informally uh, interviewed as she's observed. And she's talking about this patient um, who happens she happens to discover he has sleep apnea, which was undiagnosed prior to the extensive burns. His respiratory status is a concern, and I won't give him Valium again because I don't trust his reaction to it. Basically, the fentanyl took a long time to actually work. Then it caught up with him, and then it took a long time for him to get rid of it. Hence, he oxygenated well, but his PACO2 was too high, it was 58, and he had severe sleep apnea, severe. Even during the rest from the scrubbing of the burn arrow, she, they had to give him some rest from that painful procedure. We had to keep waking him up with, and with the fentanyl, he just didn't wake up very well. And we had to sit on him a while, wait for him to light, lighten up. In the process of all this, his blood pressure went really high, which is not usual. Systolic was 200 at one point. Do you hear all the interpretation here? Systolic was 200 at one point. His diastolic was 120, I believe. So I just put a bunch of pillows behind him and tried to bring his chin forward to decrease that airway obstruction from the sleep apnea. I talked to the doc and gave him some nifedipine. His heart rate was really high, 160 to 175. This was all happening at one time. Did we mention clinical reason that's rapid and multifaceted and layered? This was all happening at one time. And basically I think that he, uh, that he was having sleep apnea and he was groggy. And even though I kept asking him about his pain, he said, no, my pain's fine. I think he had an underlying, I think he did have underlying pain though, because, but he couldn't articulate because he was so groggy. He was too groggy. Once I finally, um, once he was finally awake enough and his meds had worn off enough and he started to wake up a little more, he then could articulate that, had, that he had a little pain. So I gave him just a smidgen of morphine and his heart rate started back down again. And by that time, the nifedamine had assisted in lowering the blood pressure and he's doing better. Um, so, and so the interviewer at this point asked, so you think that his, um, his uh, hyper, hypertension was pain related? And she says, I don't think, or his symptoms were all pain related. I don't think they were all pain related. I think probably stress also influenced them. But I was concerned that we did have some deeper problems going on because I wasn't sure how well he was oxygenated oxygenating. He had blood gas and he was oxygenating fine, but because of, he, he has all four, four extremities burned and both ears, it's hard to get a pulse oximeter reading. Right now we happen to be lucky. It happens to be working, but it's really intermittent. I felt like I was struggling. So at one point, because there were all these things happening, I was really unsure what was going on. And I didn't want to give him, I wanted to give him something to control his blood pressure because he kept denying pain to me. 
but I was also concerned. I didn't want to vasodilate him too much because he was a little bit hemodynamically dry. I'm not totally sure where we were because we were a little bit dry, although he looks a lot better. Now, I give this messy language, right? It's the uncertainty, it's the multiple layers. So all of these thoughts were going on. And basically, once he woke up a little, uh, he wanted something to drink. He realized, oh, my hands are hurting. Um, so after so after I gave him a little bit of morphine, his heart rate came down. His blood pressure had already come down some with the nifedamine. As far as the burn steps, fluids go, he is doing well. We're going to put him on a CPAP mask. I talked to him about his sleep apnea at home. He said, yes, my wife states that I do stop breathing during the night and then he is exhausted in the morning when he wakes up. He said, as long as he wakes up in the morning and he always wakes up. So he, he didn't ever have it treated. Um, he says, no, there's no re reason to treat it. I always wake up. Here's, here's an, another, I put this in yellow because I want you to notice. Um, so there you have it. So. We, we put him on a CPAP mask now, and that's why I'm waiting for respiratory to call back. I wanna make sure, here's, here's what I want you to notice. I wanna make sure we keep his pulses in his fingers. And that's what uh, the nurse is checking on now. She doesn't really have a circumferential radial arm burns, but he has all this edema uh, that will be created with the fluids we've given him and we want good circulation down to his fingers. So you hear how practical reasoning is guided by the notions of good, of wanting to retrain, retain the circulation in the tips of his fingers. And then he got more burns on his right hand. So his right hand will be even more important to check on cir circulation. So I, I just want you to really hear how responsible action in relation to the for sake of, in order to the patient's um, needs and well-being guides practical reasoning. Um, you just don't get that kind of guidance from scientific reasoning alone. Um, and also this sort of situated problem solving and situated thinking in action is far more than application of knowing that and about. Um, it's the productive use of knowledge in situations. We have almost no situated counts of thinking in action in nursing practice. And I think this is scandalous. I, uh, in, in my studies of um, the skill acquisition model, I, we observed, interviewed um, over 650 nurses. And we, we gathered all of these narrative accounts, these first person experience near accounts of actual practice. And I just, it was such a strong lesson for me of how little uh, administrators, even uh, even practicing nurses, really have good language to articulate the nature of that situated thinking and action that is characteristic of expert practice. Um, unlike high reliability organizations, hospitals are tend to be more protocol driven, uh, checklist driven uh, and, and really focused a lot on systems engineering. We do not like high reliability organizations study the knowledge embedded in expert nursing practice, nor track successes or failures of our frontline knowledge workers. Uh, for example, during COVID, we had no structures and process at hand to study what the nurses and physicians were learning directly from the COVID patients. And all of our analogical reasoning was far off because COVID was much more neurological. It was absolutely novel. And we didn't have anything in place 
to capture learning as we went through that crisis. So we're not taking practice as a way of knowing uh, seriously in its own right. I'd be happy to hear comments on this. I get very exercised about it because I, I think it's really critical at this point in time in the acute nursing shortage. And I think hospitals are gonna be hard put to compete for staff nurses, uh, particularly staff nurses who stay in the hospital for long periods of time. I want you, I want to take you just on a quick tour of what it's like to be an advanced beginner, a new graduate nurse, not a novice, that's the first year of nursing school. But typically it takes them longer to do everything. Their temporal focus as a result remains on the immediate present. They often have to delegate up to get interpretation of actual clinical variations. Is this drainage excessive, more than you would expect? Um, is this patient waking up quickly or slowly from surgery? So nurses with experience develop all these tacit expectations. Um, and the new graduate um, is um, only human. They cannot be beyond experience. They haven't lived through a lot of patient futures, so they don't have this tacit set of expectations or these comparative judgments. But they do have a beginning agency and watching the senior nursing student and the new graduate nurses just um, tells me so much about what we ought to be doing in nursing education to make that agency develop quick, more quickly. Um, but forecasting is limited um, by their experience. Um, there is a lot of rely, reliance necessarily on protocols. New graduate nurses often rely on charting what's charted to guide their practice. But you will seldom meet a more engaged, uh, committed, dedicated learner what they can't be because unfortunately they're human like us, they cannot be beyond experience. So this isn't a trait or talent deficit, it's an experience level deficit. The new graduate is busy developing a perspective. Their um, empathic understanding of and evaluating the patient uh, discomfort is a real thought project and a, a part of their clinical learning that is, is writ large. They're busy establishing boundaries, trying to get their skills of involvement uh, honed. And if they don't develop good skills of involvement, they will never become experts because your skills of engagement determine what kind of information flow you will get from the clinical situation. Um, they're busy looking for credible sources of knowledge and people who can coach them. They have what we, we decided to call a cushion of inexperience because they have secondary ignorance. They do not know what they don't know because they haven't been exposed to it. Um, work is very hard because it's perceived as multiple and competing tasks. They don't have a strong sense of salience yet where some things just stand out as more or less important. Um, probably if they walk into acute respiratory distress, they won't make a problem list. But few, fewer things stand out as really salient and capturing the um, urgency and priority of what has to be done. Um, they're busy matching examples in their clinical practice with textbook accounts. This is going to keep their expertise down. Uh, think back to the burn nurse's account. She was far away from textbook account 
as she described the dynamic changes in that patient. So what can you do? And, and it's really tough right now because some units have a preponderance uh, of uh, new graduate nurses because the shortage is so acute. So what you try to offer is situated coaching with particular situations um, to help them make sense of what's going on in the clinical situation, to help them develop that sense of salience. You give situated coaching uh, to help them recognize early warnings about changes in the patient's clinical condition, um, perhaps pulmonary hypertension tension or um, uh, early stages of shock, hypovolemic shock. Provide, you provide also, and many people don't think to do this, but it's important to give them the local practical organizational knowledge that they need to know to get through the day. Um, there are informal timelines, for example, on units when they like to get things done or when rounds are usually made and you need to fill them in and not try to make them learn all of this um, by their own investigation because it takes too much effort and time. So often nurses carry around very effective planning sheets uh, that help them with time organization and management. Well, you wanna make these planning sheets available and discuss them and help them with these very practical tastes tasks that become taken, taken for granted on a unit over time, as if they were God ordained, they just become rituals and routines. But you try to make these available to the new graduate without ha them having to figure it out all on their own. So uh, one of the questions which I thought was excellent, and I, I, I should pause here, um, was if we don't have expert nurses to help those advanced beginners, what do we do? And um, I have some suggestion here. I think each shift and care unit needs a resident expert clinician to be on call to coach the advanced beginner. And they actually need to make rounds on the advanced beginner because um, that secondary ignorance problem, the advanced beginner doesn't always know when to call for help. But at the very least, a Zoom telemedicine kind of system for instant consultation and, and, and when necessary, encourage calling a rapid response team um, for rapidly changing situations that if you had all expert units, uh, nurses on your unit, you might not need. But with advanced beginners, you will need this kind of backup of expert experiential based knowledge. Um, so the goal is to keep offering situated coach coaching to increase situated awareness. Um, on med surge units, cluster patient assignments for the new graduates so they can take care of a lot of stroke patients consecutively or a lot of uh, coronary artery disease patients consecutively. So they can begin to develop this comparative judgment. We find that um, nurses advance more quickly in critical care simply because the patient population is much um, less varied and the, and the problem situations are much more predictable. And you can deal with that a bit on the med surge unit if you tailor those, those clinical assignments so that students are having repetitive experiences with multiple uh, cases of patients with stroke or cardiovascular disease or, or whatever. And why not provide expert clinical narratives, relevant, salient, Popul patient population uh, information on a particular unit so that you can get the students these accounts of situated thinking and action, of rapid expert clinical reasoning, 
practical reasoning across time. And this is far more effective than any case study you would ever use because you get that situated thinking in action, you get a strong sense of the case unfolding across time. And um, it, it stays true to the way things unfold. Um, so by using first person experience near narratives, much like the burn example I gave you, um, we can make the expert frontline nurse's knowledge more, more visible and we can reward it, we can develop it, but as long as we're so ignorant of it, we won't be very good at development. Um, do you have a rich narrative count of every successful patient early warning? every successful patient rescue? Do you have a rich narrative account of every failure to rescue and the contextual aspects of that failure? This is what it means to be um, a really conscientious, high reliability organization that focuses on knowledge development in the front lines. So thoughts and questions. I know this is a tough time um, for getting um, uh, support for advanced beginners um, and with the nurse nursing shortage. Um, we, have, we have a few questions on that. Okay, great. Um, so we have some people asking about um, a lot of managers rely on advanced beginners to mentor other advanced beginners or new grad nurses. Um, and we often forget that you, they need support as well. Um, so how do we, how do we support, um, you know, both advanced beginners themselves and advanced beginners supporting other advanced beginners? Yes. Um, well, it's true that an advanced beginner that's six months ahead will have something to offer to that, that new graduate, I think. But if at all possible, you really want them to be, uh, to have access to situated coaching from that expert nurse or from the um, even proficient or competent level nurse. Uh, because you're trying to develop their clinical imagination and you're trying to um, decrease their secondary ignorance, their cushion of inexperience. So if you just have them paired with advanced beginners, they don't get the um, development of clinical imagination and the problem solving that you saw with the, um, with the, I think that uh, burn nurse who was working with a new graduate nurse that day and she was having the new graduate do something that the new graduate could do around checking for perfusion. But think how much learning could occur between the expert and that advanced beginning nurse. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then um, there seems to be a lot of interest about the on-call resident nurse. Um, and I is that, do you know any organizations that currently do that? Uh, I do know many hospitals have developed uh, deep, more decentralized staff development where they have the resident staff development nurse on every unit. Um, but I know that's, it's a hardship right now to think of making that happen. But where you can, I mean, um, one of the things that just, you know, it needs to be our mantra, um, patient safety isn't fungible. It's not exchangeable. It's the best and most important good in itself. And so the more you can support the, the protection of the patient and the development of that frontline clinical knowledge, the more you recognize it as an organization, um, uh, the better you will be at 
promoting it, rewarding it. Um, so, but I, I do think that at this time of uh, low, low level of tenure on units to have a, a in-resident uh, situated coach, it, it would be a terrific uh, assistance in patient safety and in development of the nurse so that they increase it, increasingly become safer. Sure, and I think I'm gonna um, hand it to Eloise for a second. I think she has a question. So Patricia, every time I hear the narrative account of the burn nurse, I am so blown away. First of all, that when we see that picture, when we hear the story, we can see the picture and we all know what that feels like to be in that intense situation, trying to make decisions, um, keeping the patient as the focus, uh, thinking as fast as you can, pulling in other people when you need to, worrying about 50 things at once. It's really remarkable work. And, and I'm always struck by the chasm that exists between the textbook description of what it means to be a burn nurse, and then you hear what it really means to be a burn nurse in a particular situation. And all of that richness gets lost if we don't hear the story. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's an old philosophical problem of uh, the limits of formalism and our just great tradition of talking about things in terms of knowing that and about as this, you know, standing over against an objective situation, rather than giving an account from an engaged, situated actor, agent, who is actively working for good ends. I mean, ah, the circulation in the fingertips. I mean, this is after the, this is after the high uh, PCO2. It's after the worry about the sleep apnea and the grogging. I mean, uh, this is so multi-layered and so attentive and so yeah. curious. Yeah, and it all gets lost unless we hear the story. I think that's really yes. the point that you're trying to make, isn't it? That unless we hear the story, all that richness just gets lost and we think that what we do is what the textbook says we do. Right. And, and it all feels like everything can be delegated. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, that's that scary place we're at right now where there is the desire to go back to, um, to that earlier era. Oh God, I lived through that, you guys, uh, of uh, teen nursing. Uh, and um, um, so one of the things that happens with burnout is this loss of connection to meaning of one's practice. And I just keep thinking if we had been much better, I love the Arizona account of the nurses work with COVID patients. It's brilliant. And if you haven't seen that video, we should make it available. I know you've seen it, Eloise, but we didn't do enough to listen to the frontline nurses. We didn't do enough to uh, stay curious about what they were confronting. And of course, it, no one had been exposed to that many patient deaths. Um, so, but I think the burnout, um, because the work was so important and because it was life-saving and it was life-giving and it was um, sacred work in terms of allowing families um, with video uh, FaceTime to be with their family members. There was so much meaningful, there were so many meaningful things going on. And we focused on the victimization and on the burnout and the difficulty and, and we didn't focus on the, um, well, the human challenge and the human meanings. And that's where I think we keep getting um, pulled back or sucked down or 
uh, leveled in our practice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ben. There's a few questions kind of off of that about um, specifically COVID and uh, how even expert nurses during that time, because it was so new and something that many of us never experienced before, how even they uh, doubted themselves as expert nurses. Well, they weren't expert nurses in in care of COVID patients that you can't be beyond experience. And so what, you, what helps is saying, this is a novel virus. Ah, we're finding out it's more neurological. Ah, it doesn't, the analogs for how long the patients had to be on respirators, completely different than other viruses. Once you publicly and socially acknowledge um, that and you quit trying to pretend there's an analog out there that's gonna work for you as if you know what's going on, um, you, you're better off. I mean, you're on a new frontier, you are learning. And you can't be beyond experience. And we were all new with COVID. Everyone was new. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's still, we're still learning today about. Yeah. Is it still evolving? But we're far from, you know, really understanding this virus, I think. Um, and then there's a few about burnout as well between um, the number of expert nurses leaving the workforce. Um, turnover and uh, ex talking about expert and seasoned nurses, um, you know. It, you know, if I could introduce one administrative fiat, sure. I would introduce um, that we will just stop all of these crazy uh, short formulas of uh, quickly changing staffing at the last minute in order to save money. Um, this is no time to be doing that. And uh, when nurses are overloaded and they're caring for a lot of COVID patients, the work is novel. We don't need to be adding uncertainty with rapid shift variation or staffing variation. Um, so there are some administrative things that we could do um, Quit imagining you can reduce cost of staffing right now. It's not, it's not possible given the variability in the demands and the short staffing. Yeah. Or the quick, or there are really no quick fixes, right? I mean, we, you know, we think that building resilience is the answer, but it's really not about resilience. It's about being connected to the practice and right. feeling a sense of meaning and accomplishment and good. Talk about that, Patricia. Well, the, um, I love the, um, and I hope I'm right, it's either New Mexico or Arizona, nurses that uh, Time, uh, New York Times featured, um, it was called Nursing at the Front Lines, and Eloise and I'll make sure you get the reference, because these nurses demonstrated the most exquisite skills of engagement. And it was awe-inspiring what, uh, as they described the difficulty, you know, uh, of multiple deaths and not having a family with a dying patient. Um, they also talked about how important it was to be there for those patients. Yeah. and what they learned from those patients. And that's what we have to elaborate. Um, one of my all time um, favorite narratives is called Seeing Joan Through from Loyola, called Loyola um, Chicago uh, Medical Center. And Joan came in age 52 multi-organ system failure. She had, she needed triple valve replacement. She had had rheumatic fever as a child. And now she was having um, liver failure, uh, multi-organ system failure. And it took two months of painstaking dobutamine titration, 
uh, uh, range of motion, uh, shoring up communication, uh, at least a month of that time, Joan was combative uh, due to encephalopathy. And so at, at the end of two months, they finally had her uh, in in um, nutritional balance and 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 organ restoration, so that she was um, a candidate for surgery for triple valve replacement. And the nurses got this brilliant idea. Here she was, institutionalized right down the middle of the bed. And the nurses thought, oh, she needs to leave this unit symbolically and come back alive to know that she could do that. And so they arranged this big festive trip to see an overbridge at Loyola and look at the Chicago lights and come back safely to the unit. The nurses were so inventive. And she got through that two months with no contractures, no skin breakdown, and the careful, astute titration to help her get out of that multi-organ failure. Which is more difficult technically and humanly, um, the triple valve replacement or that two months? How do we, I mean, I, I went to Russia when after the Soviet period and they were trying to restore nursing practice because they discovered they, they had five levels of doctors. They didn't really want nursing practice because it was too Christian during the Soviet period, but they discovered they couldn't have modern medicine without titrating the dolbutamin, right? Without taking care of the skin, without taking care of the multi-organ failure. And so when we, we chose the title, making the practice of nursing visible, it's what nursing must accomplish in order to make the medicine work, right? And we don't have good public language or articulation of that. I think um, that's a great point, Dr. Bunner. And I, how, I think, how do we um, get preceptors or nurses currently in the practice that are, you know, expert or along that um, skill acquisition level and how do we teach them to bring to bring that out when they're precepting or to bring that out in their day to day it um, nurses on the unit know they know who they go to when they have a tough clinical problem um, you just have to get close enough to the front line to see it you know as long as you're removed and you're depending only on statistics and metrics, you won't get into that coal face, into that front line knowledge. And so the knowledge, um, we'll talk more about that. Maybe we could move on a bit because that's, that's the very center of high reliability organizations that they know where the knowledge workers are and how to learn from them. So um, someone brought up the question of team nursing and bureaucratizing solutions to the current shortage. And here in Las Vegas, let me tell you, all the hospitals are doing team nursing. It scares me to death. I would have myself flown out of the area if uh, I needed acute care right now. Because I lived through that period of the late 60s, early 70s, when we suddenly had this forever change in acute care. We suddenly had instantaneous therapies. Almost all patients had IVs. We had uh, cardiac monitors with instantaneous reversals of arrhythmias. And it suddenly became incredibly dangerous to have team nursing where you didn't have your frontline clinical reasoners in contact and observation of the patient. Um, but now instantaneous diagnosis and interventions have only increased in today's acute care settings. Most of our hospitals are like extended ICUs. Um, delegated removed care 
um, uh, delegating the care to auxiliary staff to replace professional nurses is dangerous. Auxiliary staff have little or no situational awareness, no fault of their own. They have a lack of skill in making rapid interventions and rapid clinical reasoning. Um, so we have a horrible situation brewing. Uh, and I think we keep having to have the mantra as a notion of good internal to medicine and nursing, patient safety is not fungible. Uh, we, can't, we can't just go to quick fix bureaucratic delegated care. Administrators who see thinning out of professional nurses as a bureaucratic solution to nursing shortages show an outdated crisis outdated view of knowledge requirement for nursing performance and lack of understanding of um, rapid clinical reasoning and situated thinking and action and instantaneous therapies required for patient rescue and prevention of sentinel and never events. Um, this is what scares me. I mean, I, I, and yet I know if you're in the hospital and there are no nurses, um, it's a very, very challenging situation, but we have to look at it as um, shoring up and making more of that observational time available. I mean, we also have a shortage of physicians as well. Um, so um, if you have thoughts on that, I mean, it's a terrible uh, situation. I do think we can make more use of resident staff experts and development people on each unit that have low tenure in their nursing staffing. And we can use more um, telemedicine kind of consultation. Um, the other thing that I think is so important to do is to prevent nurses uh, from leaving during the competence stage. Um, if you can begin to inoculate that advanced beginner, oh, please don't, don't leave when it feels so hard to you because it's going to get better. And if you leave, you just regress and you have to learn all over again. Um, because if you leave during that confident phase, it will make it take you longer to progress to proficiency and expert. And that is a real shame because it's so hard uh, to be stuck in that time. I, so I just wanted to go through a little of the nature of the competent period. It's a time of planning and analysis. I like to say the nurse is so busy speaking to the situation, the situation can't get a word in it edgewise. There is a lack of attunement at the competent stage. They're busy limited the, limiting the unexpected through planning and prediction. Um, there is growth because now, as they'll quickly point out in all the observations the interview, the anxious times are now more tailored to the situation. When they're anxious, there's usually a good reason for being anxious. Um, their clinical forethought, because they now live through more futures, is getting better, as is their perceptual clinical grasp. Um, but they confront the limits of formal knowledge not everything is in the textbooks. And from my own you know, years of experience observing competent nurses, the questions they would ask, they would ask, you know, uh, were baffling. <laughs> they would, well, what do you do for hiccups on controlled respirator? Um, it's not quickly found in, in the textbook. Um, they also, there are many more ways to act then you can possibly pull off. So you have to learn to choose a perspective on the situation. Um, thank God pattern recognition and tacit knowledge is development, developing so that you begin to have a kind of um, 
intuitive grasp of when a patient isn't waking up quickly enough or a patient isn't tolerating that shift in fluid shift in warming up from open heart surgery. The other thing that happens at the competence stage is that encountering the patient's suffering anew. It's as if um, during the advanced beginner stage, they um, are so busy caught up learning tasks and getting things done that the patient recedes a while. And now the patient's suffering may come in in a very, very strong way. That's very disturbing. So um, there's a process of disillusionment because they now can recognize that not everyone is an expert nurse, that they lack the resources on the unit, certainly if they're on a unit with low tenure. Um, and the limits of planning and predicting is frustrating. I mean, it's a makeshift situation. Um, so there is this kind of crisis in trust an excessive sense of responsibility. This is the time where they go out and buy huge medical textbooks looking for answers to practical problems. And you can see that there's no time to leave the job. Um, if you can give them situated coaching, if you can have them work with proficient and expert uh, nurses, um, so that they begin to uh, be more attuned and adjust themselves to the situation. Um, and I think the best thing you can do for the competent nurses, pair them with expert and proficient nurses to help them develop clinical imagination and enhance experiential learning. Um, um, so anything you can do, and, and there has been some research, I know in my own hospitals I was affiliated with locally in California, uh, they found if they kept nurses through the second year, they were likely to have those same nurses 10 years later. It's a huge retention strategy. So we're coming to a close here, but the catching up with high reliability organizations, it took 23 years for hospitals to really begin to identify and, and, and consider themselves as high reliability organizations. It, the work started in 1987. It was introduced in hospitals um, in 2006. Um, why can Sutcliffe's my favorite book on um, high reliability organization and they, um, they talk a lot about mindfulness and knowing what you don't know and studying um, failures, preoccupation with tracking uh, small failures. Um, and they point out you get complacent when you study successes only. It's important to study success, but you shouldn't only study success. Uh, reluctance to simplify operation. This has been a major problem. Don Abedian's suggestion that we need to decrease all variability also decreases like reliability because in highly variable situations, the last thing you need to do is reduce variability. So we need to be much more sophisticated um, about not oversimplifying operations. Um, and again, go back to the burn nurse example. Um, there's a limit to simplifying that. Um, this respect and deference and recognition of frontline expertise, knowing who your expert nurses are and getting um, both observing their practice and getting the first person experienced near narratives. Um, so I thought I'd close with my, it's my, my privilege of my age, my unfulfilled um, research base wish dreams. If I could wave a magic wand, 
I would have clinical promotion systems that develop, make visible, extend, um, and understand better the expertise in clinical nursing practice. I would require first person, as we did at Boston, uh, experience near narratives as a center point for clinical promotion programs. And I would also publish those narratives and make them public so that we begin to have a language of situated thinking and action and rapid clinical reasoning across time and situational awareness. Um, that we study and better understand failure to rescue. Um, and again, that situated account, not statistical accounts, uh, but what goes wrong? What, what made a rescue successful? Um, what, what impeded a possible rescue? Um, so how, how we make, I mean, if I had money for every, every time I've had administrators say to me, oh, we need to give more continuing education to nurses. Oh, we need to listen to the nurses at the front line. We need to study their practice. We need to understand it better. We need to be curious and attentive and responsive to the nature of expert clinical reasoning, which is what's required in today's uh, acute care settings with instantaneous therapies. Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, we only scheduled for an hour and we could, I'm sure, go on for much longer than that. Um, and I am, thank you very much, Dr. Benner, for um, all of your insight tonight. I know everyone appreciated it. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Stephen to uh, give some closing remarks. Hello there. What an exciting start of Nurses Week. Um, thank you, Dr. Benner, for your, your time. We really appreciate having you here tonight and sharing all of this knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, I was tasked with um, having a few of my own takeaways, and it was definitely a little bit of a pressure, but this is what I came up with. Um, so this is definitely a challenging time for nursing, but it's also an exciting time. You know, it's really an opportunity. Um, we can't continue to have the richness in nursing get lost. Mm. Um, nursing, everything that we know cannot be delegated and patient safety is the ultimate goal. Patient safety is not fungible. It's the most important good in itself. Nursing is not scientific knowledge alone. Expert nursing practice also includes rapid practical and clinical reasoning, knowing the how and when, situational awareness. Um, so I'm a nursing leader at Wild Cornell. So, you know, this was great for me and I really seek to be more innovative and really incorporate situated coaching to increase situational awareness and, and thinking um, for the nurses on my unit. Um, and we could really do this by sharing, as you had shared, rich narrative accounts, including providing expert interpretation, articulation, and coaching of these cases. And you know, not only focusing on our successes, but also on our failures. And then finally, you know, a big challenge that we all have today, you know, some areas of the US more than others, but our workforce. Um, and I mean, I think you've laid it out perfectly well. We really have to look at our care models. And I, I think one popular suggestion or idea was the resident expert clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you again, Dr. Benner. We really appreciate your time. And you know, thank you to everybody that joined us tonight. Um, we, this was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, have a lovely spring, everybody, and stay safe and, and well. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Benner. Great.